Hello everyone, my name is Laura Salazar and I am one of the negotiators for the Grants Administration Division. Today my colleagues and I, Nellie Nino and Tammy Michaels, will be walking you through how to complete the ESSA Consolidated Grant application. This presentation is being presented as a recording. However, you can still enter questions using the Q&A feature. We will monitor the questions to provide answers at the end of the presentation live, and in some cases, if it is a simple or short answer, we will respond to you in the Q&A section. A link to access the voiceover presentation and handouts will be added to the Grants Administration Grant Resources webpage after each training. The Grants Administration Grant Resources link offers training documents and webinar videos over the following federal 2022-2023 formula grants. Special Education Consolidated Federal Grant, ESSA Consolidated Grant, and Perkins 5 Grant. Before we get started, please note, this presentation is intended solely to provide general information and guidance to Texas LEAs and reflects the Texas Education Agency's current understanding of the presentation topics and applicable federal guidance. The content of this presentation is subject to change as a result of further potential information and guidance provided by federal agencies with regulatory oversight of these programs. This presentation does not constitute legal advice, and LEAs are therefore advised to seek legal counsel regarding the information and guidance provided in this presentation before acting on such information and guidance. Here's a look at the first schedules that need to be submitted to start working on the ESSA application grant. All of these are already open. The due date for the 2022-2023 ESSA Consolidated Grant application is September 2nd of 2022. So there are at least three full months to submit this grant. However, we strongly recommend that you do not wait to the last minute and you submit your application as early as possible. As usual, once planning amounts are calculated and become available, they will be posted on TEA's entitlements page. There are virtual and in-person training opportunities available for ESSA Consolidated, SPED Federal Consolidated, and Perkins 5. The virtual training options will take place on June 7th and the 16th. The in-person trainings will take place on June 24th at the Region 13 Educational Service Center. The agenda for today will include the following topics actions you need to take prior to starting the application, accessing eGrants, your TEAL login, and selecting roles that allow for different levels of access to create, revise, and submit grant applications, the required schedules that must be completed before accessing the application, such as the Special Collections SC-5003, and the Applicant Designation and Certification Form, also known as the ADC, how to access the grant within eGrants, reviewing applicant information and contacts selected, completing the schedules, important information to consider, budget and supporting documentation, the gun free report, and updates in the 2022-2023 ESSA Consolidated Federal Application. Finally, we'll also be reviewing grant resources that may assist you along the way. There are a few preparations that TE strongly suggests doing to get ready for all e-grants. The first thing is review and update all the information and Ask TED. Be sure LEA and campus information and Ask TED is current. Work through your district's Ask TED coordinators to check and update campus information and grade span. As you check and update other LEA information, TA's homepage can be very helpful. Several items we will discuss today are located at the top of the TEA homepage in the top blue ribbon, like Ask TED, Grant Opportunities, and TEAL Login. After consulting with your district's coordinator to update information in Ask TED, please verify staff has TEAL and eGrants access. 
Obtain a copy of the most recently approved 2021-2022 ESSA application. Review it and please review the negotiation items to avoid renegotiating the same items year to year. Then use that application to help complete the 2022-2023 application. Be sure LEA's contacts are updated. Remember, this is not just for ESSA. Information in the Contacts tab includes SPED and Perkins contacts. Be sure to include the grantee official who will be certifying and submitting the Schedule SC5003, the ADC form, and the grant applications. Include also the primary and secondary contacts for ESSA, SPED, and Perkins 5, and others who may be submitting negotiation responses for the original grant and or amendments. TA has migrated all its web applications such as eGrants and ER to be compatible with Chrome. This is an agency-wide initiative to remove Internet Explorer from our applications to enhance security for our web-based applications. We no longer test eGrants applications with Internet Explorer. We now test the applications using Chrome as our browser to ensure they are compatible with Chrome. Coordinate with other staff members. Collaborate with SPED and Perkins staff members who also have a stake in completing the contacts information and the SC5003. Work with the business office staff to, to be sure items budgeted in the application are properly coded. For example, knowing your LEA's capitalization level is key for properly budgeting supplies and capital outlay. Knowing your LEA's capitalization level will help to avoid amendments later in the year. Work with those involved with the comprehensive needs assessment and properly document activities in the grant application. There should be a strong connection between needs identified through the CNA and those provided by the grant. Fiscal agents can begin communicating and setting up arrangements with member districts. If you need a list of your SS8 members, access your current ESSA application, and on the schedule BS6001, there is a button that will produce a report of your current SSA members. One more group you may begin to consult with are the private nonprofit organizations. Start having meaningful consultations about ESSA in order to complete the schedule PS3099. Private Nonprofit Schools Equitable Services Schedule. After completing all the preparations and knowing the capabilities of each role, let's see how to get access to the ESSA Consolidated Grant Application and other e-grants. The first thing to do is access TEAL. Go into the TEA homepage. At the very top, there's a blue ribbon and there's a link, TEAL Login. By selecting the link, you will be taken to the TEA Login screen. If you don't have a TEAL account, click on the Request New User Account link. You will be directed to a screen to provide information and submit your request. From requesting access to eGrants, the correct county district number, CDN, and vendor ID number will be needed. You will be given your username and a temporary password. Then you will gain access to Teal and set up your unique password. Please make sure that when you first set up your login, that you go in and answer the security questions. In the event that you forget your password, security questions will help to reset your password. We are not able to reset it for you. If you do misplace or forget your password, you will need to place a help desk ticket for assistance. Your username is a single user, and once you have it, whether you're in one district or another, it will stay the same. Program staff and grant writers should know who the grantee official is, so once they have completed the information in the application, they can notify and follow up appropriately with the grantee official to be sure the application has been submitted to TEA. On the other hand, if you already have a TEAL account, go ahead and sign in. This table shows you specifically the eGrants roles in blue on the left. Each role has different capabilities based on the different areas of eGrants. 
in the black along the top. For example, in the Contacts tab of eGrants, all roles except Grantee Viewer can modify information. Another example, for functions under the Grants tab, the grantee official is the only one authorized to delete drafts and submit original applications. These two privileges are the only difference between grantee manager and grantee official while working under the Grants tab. This chart is available on the Grant Resources webpage. You do not need to wait until the grant application is launched by TEA to update contacts information in eGrants. This tab is available to update at any time, and this is not just for ESSA. Information in the Contacts tab also includes SPED and Perkins contacts. Be sure to include the grantee official who will be certifying and submitting the SE5000, ADC, and grant applications. Primary and secondary contacts for ESSA, SPED, and Perkins 5. Others who may submit negotiation responses for the original grant and or amendments. Now that you have access to eGrants, let's see how you apply for the ESSA Consolidated Grant. The first step will be to submit the schedule SC5003. This is a consolidated schedule that contains and requests information for ESSA, SPED Federal, SPED State, and Perkins. To access Schedule SC5003, you will log into Teal. Once you're logged into Teal, the current slide shows you a visual of what you will see after logging in. You will find a list of different sections with applications such as eGrants, ESSA reports, expenditure reporting, and others. Go to the eGrants section and select the eGrants role that will permit you to work on the ESSA application. For example, ESC staff may have grantee viewer role or grantee manager role. Once in the eGrants page, enter the county district number on the top right corner. Then you will find the schedule SE 5003 under the Special Collections tab. Select the SE 5003 Formula Grants Consolidated Schedule link from the list and start reviewing the information and make updates as appropriate. If the form does not appear or the status shows closed, please contact your TA negotiator. Here is the schedule SE 5003. It consists of two parts, and both parts must be completed to submit this form. In Part 1, all three grant programs, ESSA, SPED, and Perkins, will need to include any barriers to equitable access and participation for groups receiving services. Be sure you allow the other grant programs, SPED, and Perkins staff to complete this section before it is certified and submitted. If no barriers exist, the LEA can select the first radio button. For each barrier, select the appropriate group. Click on the instructions or the help buttons for the list of the standard barriers. Part 2 has three small sections. Part 2A contains the links to the general guidelines, provisions and assurances, debarment and suspension, and the lobbying certification. Click the item link to open the document and complete the lobbying activity section as appropriate. Part 2B contains the program-specific guidelines and the program-specific provisions and assurances. Part 2C is the certification for these documents. Checking this box confirms that the LEA will comply with these requirements. Once all the program staff, ESSA, SPED, and Perkins have completed and reviewed Parts 1 and 2, the authorized official will need to certify and submit the Schedule 5003. Once the SC5003 has been submitted and the application has been opened by TEA, the grant application will appear under the Grants tab under Apply for Eligible Grants. It will show you the list of grant names ready to open. Clicking on the 2022-2023 ESSA grant application name will open up several forms associated with the ESSA grant. Now we move on to the Applicant Designation and Certification. 
You will log in through Teal. Once in eGrants, enter your CDN, just like I described from the schedule SC5003. This time you will select the Grants tab to find the ESSA grant. Here's the screen you will see after you click on ESSA grant. Under the ESSA grant, there will be a list of different forms. Go ahead and select the 2022-2023 ESSA Applicant Designation and Certification Form. If you are unable to see the form or it is marked closed, please contact your negotiator immediately. This form has two parts. The part one of the form is the designation. You can see it now on the slide. In this part, you will identify how you will apply for each funding source. Please select the radio button for each funding source. It is important to select a radio button for all available funding sources unless they are grayed out. You have four options. Apply on own as an independent, as a fiscal agent of a shared services arrangement, mostly ESC service centers, as a member of a shared services arrangement, and it is very important to identify if you will not be applying for a source of funds program at all. If you're not eligible or you do not have funds for a specific program or funding source, that line will be disabled and grayed out. At the end of part one, there is a link for the LEA's current entitlements. Part two is the certification and incorporation. The grantee official will select his or her name from the list in the authorized official section. Next, the system will populate automatically the submitter information and then authorized official can go ahead and click the certify and submit button. Once the ADC form is completed and submitted, the ESTA grant application will appear and be ready to work. We will now begin to look at the steps you need to take when opening the grant. The first schedule that should be completed is the GS2100 schedule, the applicant information. This schedule displays the applicant information including primary and secondary contacts for the grant. Because these individuals be the first point of contact if negotiations are required, please be sure their information is accurate and up to date. I will now hand the presentation over to Nelly Nino, who will be presenting part two. Thank you, Laura. And hello to everyone joining us today. I am Nelly Nino, and I'm the Region 10 negotiator, as well as the team lead for the negotiation team responsible for Regions 1 through 10. And today I'll be going through the program schedules. Now, the first schedule you completed when you opened the application was the GS2100, the Applicant Information ske Schedule. I'm going to continue with the second schedule we would like for you to complete, the PS3109, the REAP Funding Transferability Schedule. Now, we ask that you complete these first few schedules in this particular order because, if applicable, information from this schedule populates on other schedules. So, first of all, if you're not choosing to use REAP or funding transferability this year, then you only need to complete the does not apply boxes in both parts A and B and save the schedule and go to the next one. If you are choosing REAP or funding transferability, I'll go over how you do that. Let me start by telling you a little about the two options available to you. Be aware that only LEAs that are on the SRSA or Small Rural School Achievement Program list or REAP list are eligible to apply for REAP. And REAP allows you more flexibility in using the Title IIA and or Title IVA funds for activities under the title program you are REAPing into. Funding transferability is the LEA notifying TEA that you are transferring your Title IIA and or Title IVA funds to the title program you have indicated to be used for allowable activities under that title program. Please be aware that money doesn't actually move and will still show under the original title program on the program budget summary or BS 6001. So let's say you check the REAP list 
which you can access at the link indicated here, and your LEA is on it and you've decided you are going to read. You would then check the does not apply buttons for Title IIA and Title IIA under Part B and only complete Section A. If you are reaping 100% of Title IIA and Title IIA into Title IA, you would indicate 100 in the two boxes under the Title IA column and save the schedule. If you are reaping less than 100% of both Title IIA and Title IIA into Title IA, you would indicate that percentage in the two boxes under the Title IA column and save the schedule. If you are only reaping 100% of Title IIA into Title IA or any other amount, you would enter that amount under the Title IA column for Title IIA on line one and click does not apply for Title IA on line two. Now let's say you check the REAP list and you're not eligible to REAP. Well, no worries because funding transferability is available to all. So you would check the does not apply buttons in section A and complete section B by placing a percentage under the column for the title program you are transferring into for both lines one and two or does not apply for one of the lines if you are only transferring one of the title programs and then be sure to save the schedule. The third schedule we would like for you to complete is the PS3099 Private Nonprofit School Equitable Services Schedule. Part one is the private schools consultation and participation part. And on line one, it asks, are any private nonprofit schools located within the LEA's boundaries? And the second question asks, does the LEA have any Title I Part A eligible students attending private nonprofit schools outside the boundaries? If the answer is no for both questions, click no and the rest of the schedule will gray out and you can scroll to the bottom and save the schedule. If you answer yes to either question in part one, section A, section B must be completed, indicating whether private nonprofit schools are participating in any of the title programs that you are applying for. Let's say PMPs want services from Title I Part A so then you would mark yes under the Title I Part A column and so forth until all participation is indicated for all title programs. For Part 1, Section C, select both assurances. Part 2 is the equitable services calculation for the title programs. This, shy, this slide shows an example for Title II Part A. The LEA only completes Line 1, Total Student Enrollment in LEA, Line 2, Total Student Enrollment in Participating Private Schools, and, if applicable, Line 8, LEA Reservations for Direct Administration. If the LEA chooses to exercise funding transferability, Lines 5 and 6 will populate amounts with information entered on the PS3109. The system will then auto-calculate the PNP Equitable Services amount and populate that amount on line 11, the calculated private school reservation. Once this has been completed for all funding sources, save the schedule. So now that the first three schedules have been completed, the remaining schedules may be completed in any order. But I'm going to continue with the PS3101, the Title I Part A schedule, as it is the next schedule listed on the table of contents. This schedule is used to indicate district reservations. This year, there was a change made to this schedule. As you can see here in this slide, Section A, lines one and two, are now REAP lines showing amounts if you have chosen to REAP funds into Title I Part A on the PS3109. This information is for information only and does not affect allocations. Part one, section B, line one, auto-populates your entitlement amount with amounts transferred into Title I Part A indicated on lines two and three from information entered into the PS3109. 
The total funding and transfer amounts will auto calculate on line four. For section C, determine which reservations you will be applying for and select the NA boxes on the left side for any reservations you will not be applying for. A few things that you'll want to keep in mind when completing this section. If your LEA has an amount exceeding $500,000 on line four, total funding and transfer amounts, then a reservation of at least 1% is required for line one. If Title I Part A funds are being used to serve eligible private nonprofit students, the amount calculated on the PS 3099 for Part II, Section A, Question 11, is the amount you should enter on Line 2. If an amount was entered for administrative costs on the PS 3099, Part II, Section A, Question 10, that amount should be entered on Line 3. If you have served campuses offering preschool programs, you may reserve funds at the district level on line four. Administrative costs, including personnel, may be reserved on line five, but just remember that if you are reserving administrative personnel on line five, there should be admin positions indicated on the BS 6101 payroll schedule. District-wide professional development activities may be reserved on line six. A reservation of no less than $100 must be indicated for services to homeless students on line seven. Services to students in neglected or delinquent facilities should be reserved on lines eight and nine. A district reservation for foster care transportation may be reserved on line 10. And line 11 is for other reservations not designated above. So please describe these other reservation costs in the box for line 11. And just so you know, we often see ESC contracts listed here. Finally, please remember that these are district reservations, but that the majority of Title I party funding must be for direct services to students. And so the total reserved funds must be a reasonable and appropriate amount of no more than 30% and will be questioned if otherwise and remember to save the schedule. The PS 3102 is the Title I Part A Neglected and Title I Part D Subpart II Delinquent Schedule. If you serve one of these facilities, some information from the facility's special collection report will pre-populate starting with the local facility name on line one. Under the facility status section, you will only need to mark if the facility is closed, along with answering the question asking if any services were provided in the school year 22-23. Indicate the type of facility and whether, whether you are using Title I Part A or Title I Part D Subpart 2 to support the facility. Next is the date of agreement letter with your facility and the written agreement assurance box. If a facility opens after you've completed and submitted your facility special collection report, you can manually enter the information under new facility for the neglected or delinquent by completing the necessary information. Part two must then be completed for your planned expenditures and at least one expenditure must be selected. And remember to save the schedule. This is the PS 3103, the Title I Part C Migrant Schedule. If you're not applying for migrant funding, then this schedule will not show up on your table of contents. For Part 1, you'll enter the date of the most recent consultation with the Parent, Parent Advisory Committee. The consultation date should be between the first working day in January of the calendar year the grant opened and the submission date of the original application. Part two is for required program activities and part three is the priority for service action plan and all are required in order to complete the schedule. Part four is where you indicate the planned supplemental activities or services that you will be supplying to the different grade levels 
and you can select any and all that apply, but there must be at least one check for each grade level. If you choose an A for any of the four grades listed, an explanation of the NA must be entered in the box for number five. The PS3104 is the Title II Part A schedule. This year, there was a change made to this schedule also. As you can see here in this slide, Part 1, Section A, Lines 1 and 2, are now REAP lines showing amounts if you have chosen to REAP funds into or out of Title II Part A on the PS3109. This is for information only and does not affect allocations. In Part 1, Section B, Line 1 auto-populates with your entitlement amount, with amounts transferred in from Title IV Part A indicated on Line 2, and amounts transferred out of Title II Part A indicated on Line 3 from information entered into the PS3109. The total funding and transfer amounts will auto-calculate on Line 4. At the top of the page, there's a checkbox indicating that the LEA is redirecting 100% of its Title IIA funds using REAP or funding transferability. If you are REAPing or transferring all Title IIA funds out of Title IIA, then you will check this box and the rest of the schedule will not be made available to you. But if you have funding indicated on Line 4, then Section C has options for planned uses of funds and an other box for other allowable activities not included in lines one through three. And for anyone who has private nonprofit schools participating in Title II Part A on the PS 3099, be aware that line two, professional development and educator growth activities, is the only acceptable use of funds for those private nonprofit schools and should be indicated here. For those choosing number three in section C, evidence-based activities, you may have classified those as class size reduction in the past. If you are using these funds for class size reduction to hire professional staff, you will need to have documented that it is evidence-based, that it's being used to improve student outcome, and that the staff person is not being hired to meet, the, to meet the state requirement of the 22 to 1 ratio. Once you've completed this, remember to save your schedule. The PS3106 is the Title III Part A schedule. In Part 1A, Supplemental Activities for Language Instruction Educational Programs, at least one item must be checked. In Part 1B, Supplemental Activities for Parent, Family, and Community Engagement, all three activities are required, so all three boxes must be checked. And in Part 1C, Supplemental Activities for Professional Development, there are five activities listed along with an other line, but if you indicate number six other, you must also include one of the five listed activities. And remember to save your schedule. The PS3114 is the Title III Part A immigrant schedule. If you did not apply for immigrant funding, you will not see this schedule on your table of contents. For Part 1A, Supplemental Activities for Language Instruction Educational Programs, at least one activity is required. In Part 1B, Supplemental Activities for Parent, Family, and Community Outreach, NA is, as, is an acceptable response as these parent, family, and community outreach activities are not required for immigrant funding. And in Part 1C, Supplemental Activities, Support for Personnel, for teachers and paraprofessionals, you can select recruitment, training, or NA because professional development is also not required for immigrant funding. And once you've completed this, please remember to save. This is the PS3107, the Title IV Part A schedule. This year, there was a change made to this schedule also. 
As you can see here in this slide, Part 1, Section A, Lines 1 and 2 are now REAP lines showing amounts if you have chosen to REAP funds into or out of Title IV Part A on the PS 3109. This is for information only and does not affect allocations. Part 1, Section B, Line 1, auto-populates your entitlement amount with amounts transferred in from Title II Part A indicated on Line 2 and amounts transferred out of Title IV Part A indicated on Line 3 from information entered into the PS 3109 if applicable. The total funding and transfer amounts will auto-calculate on Line 4. The amount on Line 4 is the amount you'll need to reference in order to complete Part 2A. At the top of the page, there's a checkbox indicating that the LEA is redirecting 100% of its Title IV-A funds using REAP or funding transferability. If you are REAPing or transferring all Title IV-A funds out of Title IV-A, then you will check this box and the rest of the schedule will not be available to you. Let's continue with the PS 3107. In Part 1C, Planned Uses of Funds, Lines 1 through 4 must equal the amount shown in Part 1B, Line 4, Total Allocation and Transfer Amount. If the amount is less than $30,000, the LEA may select one service area from Activities to Support Well-Rounded Educational Opportunities, Activities to Support Safe and Healthy Students, or Activities to Support Effective Use of Technology. If the amount found in Part 1B Line 4 is over $30,000, then you will have to enter amounts for all three service areas based on the requirements and rules indicated. For example, funding for Line 2, Activities to Support Well-Rounded Educational Opportunities, must be a minimum of 20% of the total Title IV A budget if Part 1B Line 4 is $30,000 or more, and so on. For Line 1, Administration, you are limited to a maximum of 2% of the total Title IV-A budget, including transfers. Lines 1 through 4 and Line 5 are separated because the amounts on Lines 1 through 4 must total 100% of the total Title IV-A budget from Part 1B Line 4, and Line 5, Technology Infrastructure, is a subset of the amount listed on line four, activities to support effective use of technology, and the amount on line five is limited to 15% of the amount on line four. In part 2A, Comprehensive Needs Assessment, you're asked to check one of two boxes. Line 1 is required if the amount in Part 1B Line 4 is greater than or equal to $30,000, making it a requirement to conduct a needs assessment. On Line 2, if the amount in Part 1B is less than $30,000, a comprehensive needs assessment is not required, but the LEA must assure that they have consulted with stakeholders to determine how to prioritize the use of funds. Parts 2B and 2C are required to complete the schedule, and Parts 2D, 2E, and 2F speak to the activities you indicate above in Part 1C. So let's say you put all your money into support for safe and healthy students in Part 1C. You'd only need to check the box under Part 2E. If you selected boxes 2 through 4 in Part 1C, then the boxes for sections 2D, 2E, and 2F must be checked. And remember to save your schedule. For the SC5000, I'm just going to explain the application details, along with the two new changes, including the move of the low income percentage column to column two, and the new school-wide eligibility validation. When beginning the SC5000, you'll notice that some of the information for this schedule is pre-populated. The first piece of information that you will have to enter is in Section A, Line 2, the LEA Total Low Income Percentage. And there's a guidance document with the program guidelines that can explain how you should calculate your district's low income percentage. 
Line three asks for the LEA total enrollment. And once you enter the enrollment for each campus in section B, the system will calculate the total enrollment number and populate it on line three. Section B is where the campus selection data is entered and the following information is pre-populated from Ask Ted. The campus number, the campus name, and the campus grade level. This information is pulled from the Ask Ted database and must be validated before it will populate on the SC5000, so Ask Ted should be updated before you even start the application so that the correct information populates in the SC5000 when you open it. There is a copy prior year data button you can use if information has not changed from the previous year, and it will populate last year's basis of eligibility in the third column, campus status in column five, and the consolidated funds designation, which indicates if you are using Title I Part A only, federal funds only, or federal, state, and local funds in column eight. For the basis of eligibility, in the drop down, you have the options none, residing, enrollment, feeder pattern, optional method, and direct certification. Column four is for additional eligibility. And the other change is the validation put into place for school wide eligibility and should only be selected if applicable. For additional eligibility, the options are individual programmatic waiver, school-wide edflex waiver, school-wide previous year, and one-year transition. And just because it pre-populates does not mean you can't change the information if it needs to be tweaked. The information you will have to enter manually is each total campus enrollment in column one, each campus low-income percentage newly moved to column two, the number of students being served if the campus is being designated targeted assistance for the campus status in column six, and in column seven, other information such as closed campuses or information requested by negotiators should be indicated. Be aware that we are no longer collecting school-wide previous year or EdFlex waiver dates in the other column and that the LEA should maintain documentation locally showing evidence that the campus was previously a school-wide campus. A few general hints. Per pupil amounts no longer need to be entered in this schedule. However, you still have to follow the same rules when determining campuses to be served. Please note that LEAs with an enrollment of fewer than 1,000 students or that have only one campus are exempt in statute from having to use the poverty measures to determine which of its campuses receive Title I funds. An LEA may use other criteria, such as academic performance or the grade span of its campuses to determine which of its campuses receive Title I funds, or it may choose to allocate Title I funds to all of its campuses. Also, all documentation on how you are allocating funds should be kept locally. And remember that the SC5000 guidance document has examples of how to set these up. Please also refer to the schedule instructions for the SC5000 for rules and examples when completing this schedule. And finally, Section C, Campus Assurances, the most common campus designations we see are for school-wide, targeted assistance and skip. So if, I, so if you are using those campus designations, you'll need to check the appropriate boxes. For further instruction on this process, please contact the Federal Program Compliance Division at essasupport at tea.texas.gov and then remember to save the schedule. Only those LEAs that are eligible and require a Title I Part A carryover waiver will be contacted by the Grants Administration Division to negotiate this waiver request. The condition of eligibility is defined as an LEA with an entitlement of $50,000 or more 
and with a carryover in excess of 15% of your maximum entitlement from the previous school year. The LEA is contacted and asked to complete and submit a form to TEA and we will enter the information you submit on that form into the WB4001. Please do not complete this schedule yourself. And as for the WV4004, the EdFlex Title I Part A Schoolwide Eligibility Waiver, the schedule has been deleted. It was found with the addition of the additional eligibility column on the SC5000, this information was being duplicated and so this schedule was deleted. I will now turn the presentation over to Tammy Michaels, who will review the budget schedules and grant resources. Now we will review the budget schedules. All supporting schedules will have to be saved in order to complete the budget pages. If you do not have any funds budgeted under a specific budget code, you will still need to open the supporting schedule and save it. Part 1 shows your available funding for each fund source. These amounts are pre-populated based on how you submitted your ADC. If you selected Apply on your own, you will see planning amounts. If you selected Apply as a fiscal agent, you will see the fiscal agent's amount plus the amounts of the SSA members that have designated you as their fiscal agent. To view the list of members, click on the button at the top of the schedule title, View List of SSA Members. It will list all LEAs that selected you as their fiscal agent. You can verify who has submitted their ADC and can reach out to those who have not completed the ADC as so you may complete the application on their behalf. Part two is the section in which you will budget the amounts for each class object code. This schedule must be completed and saved with no errors before the other supporting schedules will open. This is the only time you complete the BS6001. Once it has been saved and completed with no errors, you will have access to other supporting schedules even if you receive another error message in the BS6001. Part 2, enter your details by class object code. Add payroll costs, professional and contracted services, supplies and materials, other operating costs, debt services, and capital outlay. Line 9 is where indirect costs are entered. If you do not apply for funds or have SSA members, those areas may be grayed out and you will not be able to put funds in those columns. If you transfer funds from Title II or Title IV into Title I, the funds still show up under the original budgeted sources. If you are reaping or transferring those funds into Title I, it is up to the local LEA's policy as to how they will budget those funds and paying funds out for reimbursement. This will not be shown on the budget schedule. If you add budget amounts from a class object code, then you will have to complete the supporting schedule. If you are receiving Title III Part A, Part 2B will appear and you will need to identify any direct administrative costs under the direct class object code. The system will check validations because Title III Part A is limited to no more than 2% in direct administrative costs. If you do not have any direct administrative costs, you can leave this section blank and save the schedule. If there are not any errors, the schedule should state it is complete and you can move on to the next schedule. If funds are not budgeted on the BS6001 program budget summary for class object code 6100 payroll costs, those columns in this schedule will be grayed out and you will not be able to select any of the check boxes on this schedule. Part 1 shows the amount you budgeted for each fund source. If there is a budgeted amount in Part 1, 
part two will need to be completed. Part two, line one, is for administrative support staff. Enter the number of positions for each fund source. If you split funding a position, include them on the schedule. Keep documentation locally in regard to time and effort. Part B and C are just checkboxes. You do not have to list the number of positions. Indicate if the positions are LEA or campus positions. The LEA must determine how to classify position as professional staff or paraprofessional staff. That is defined locally. The same thing applies to whether the positions are LEA level positions or campus level positions. TEA does not make the, those distinctions because every LEA is different as to how they code their personnel and their job descriptions are different. Part three, line one, school-wide personnel applies for all funding sources. Usually applies to Title I Part A funds for those campuses who have identified on the SE 5000 as being school-wide. This checkbox covers all personnel at that school-wide campus. That includes paraprofessionals and professionals or any staff member if they are being paid out of Title I Part A, you can check this box. You are not required to check them under Part 2C under campus staff. This box covers them. However, since it is only one checkbox and it covers any fund source, you have to make sure if you're using this that you are not using REAP or transferability. This would only apply for Title I Part A. If you're using REAP or transferability for Title II or Title IV and your 100% is going into Title I Part A, then that checkbox would apply for those funds that are budgeted for payroll. Also, if you want to use it for all funding sources that you budgeted for, if on the SE 5000 you're combining your funds at the campus level, the school-wide checkbox would also apply. There is no validation in e-grants for this. If you are not sure, contact your negotiator and they can look at how you have the funds budgeted and how you have your campuses de designated and help you. Line 2, stipends and extra duty pay, can be checked for any fund source. Part four, the last thing is confirmation or payroll requirements use according to all federal supplement and supplant provisions. And if you have all the documentation to determine that the positions that are being funded under these grants meet the purpose, goals, and objectives of that federal funding source, all documentation is maintained locally unless TEA requests copies of that or auditors request it. If you are paying out of these fund sources for payroll positions, make sure it is something that has been addressed in your comprehensive needs assessment for your LEA. There are two lines on this schedule that you may need to complete if appropriate. If you place funds on BS 6100 Program Budget Summary for Class Object Code 6200, then the amount will automatically go under remaining 6200 costs that do not require specific approval. If you place funds under rental or lease of buildings or professional and consulting services, any amount that is remaining will automatically go under amounts that do not require specific approval. Refer to the program guidelines and EDGAR rules for items that require specific approval. Costs that do not require specific approval are listed on page 7 and 8 of the Budgeting Cost Guidance Handbook. All other contracted services require specific approval and the amount should be listed on line 2. Also, refer to your local policies and bid processes. Examples of a cost that requires specific approval are rental or lease of buildings, space in buildings, or land. Professional development also requires specific approval. If nothing is budgeted under 6200 on the BS 6001 Program Budget Summary for Class Object Code 6200 and all the remaining amounts are zero, 
you will only need to save the schedule to complete it. We will skip 6300 Supplies and Materials because this fund source does not require specific approval. Some of the items you will see in this section are out-of-state travel, travel for students to conferences, and educational field trips. The items that require specific approval and are listed on lines one through seven. Place dollar amount under the appropriate fund source. The other operating costs on this schedule do not require you to attach any documentation to the application. Maintain documentation locally for these items. Some of these require pre-authorization and writing from TEA or USDE before that activity can occur. On TEA's website, you will find these forms that require pre-authorization and writing. These forms will need to be submitted to a specific program area. Even though you have budgeted items on this schedule and you have received your NOGA, the items that require pre-authorization and writing must be approved by the program area to have it charged to this federal grant. There is a link at the bottom of the page titled Website for Approval Documents where the approval forms are located. At the bottom of each form, it indicates where you email the form for approval. This schedule is used very rarely. This is for a lease purchase that is for more than one year. If you have a purchase that can be paid in a year, you can budget it as a direct purchase. This schedule is for a lease purchase that is usually two to three years. In part one, you will need to place the funds under the correct fund source and identify if it is a capital lease principal, capital leased interest, or interest on debt. In part two, please list a description of the property, the fund source, and the contract dates. Contract dates usually are the current year, maybe the previous year, and could also be the next year. Then complete this property value and campus number. Make sure the lease purchase is addressed in your comprehensive needs assessment. Part one, if you have nothing budgeted for library books and media or capital expenditures for additions, improvement or modifications, the remaining amount that populates in line three is for the cost that you budgeted on the BS6001 and will be items listed in part two. You will need to include a generic description of the equipment, the funding source, and the number of units. Also include a description of how it will be used to accomplish the goals of the program. We do not ask for dollar amounts or campus numbers anymore, but we do need to know the number of units and a description. Make sure not to use brand names. If line three is zero and you enter something in part two for equipment, you will get an error message that you do not have enough funds budgeted to include the equipment. Make sure the items are aligned with your local and federal policies as to how you capitalize. Federal Edgar rules say that a single unit with a cost of $5,000 or more must be capitalized. If your LEA has a more restrictive capitalization threshold, then use the one that is more restrictive. Some districts have a capitalization threshold of 500. Anything that is 500 or more needs to be placed in 6600. It also must be an allowable cost. It should be identified at your local level for the campuses and eligible students. Make sure you keep documentation on how you identify costs and it should be addressed in your CNA and DIP. If it is an item that is an unusual cost, it may require pre-authorization in writing. Negotiators will not have you remove the item if it is for unusual cost. We just want to remind you that you may need to complete a form for unusual cost and receive approval, even if it is approved in the application and you have a NOGA. It is your responsibility to submit the documentation to request this in a timely manner before you purchase these items. This is a reminder that the gun free report must be submitted in order to receive the NOGA. The report opened on May 3rd of 2022 and is due by June 29th of 2022. 
The report is in eGrants under the Compliance Reports tab. As a federal requirement to see, receive federal funds, the report must be submitted prior to receiving a NOGA. You will still be able to submit your application, but your NOGA to receive funds will not be issued until the report has been submitted to TEA. The Gun Free Report is a single page with two items. Line one, if you are applying as either on your own or as an SSA, you should mark yes that you're going to be applying for these funds. Line two, if you have had any incidents with a student that brought a firearm, check yes or no. If you mark no, you just need to complete the bottom and submit the form and you are done. If you mark yes, the campus report should show up under the district report and you can select the campus to include the information. The district report has to be submitted first in order for the process to process the application. You still need to complete the campus report if there was an incident and our program staff will be looking at it. Make sure to keep documentation because that is required under statute to continue using federal funds. We will now be looking at some helpful links for grant resources. Federal Program Compliance. At this link, there are frequently asked question documents to assist you with many of your questions on the various title programs. There's also contact information for each of the program staff members. The Grant Compliance and Administration link will give you information on the CARES Act, ESSER funding, and emergency assistance to non-public schools. It, is, it also has a brief summary of the divisions in grants administration and department functions. SE 5000 guidance document will assist you when you're completing the SE 5000 schedule by giving you an overview of each section of the SE 5000. The non-regulatory guidance link gives you information about local educational agency identification and selection of school attendance areas and schools and allocation of Title I funds to those areas and schools. The USDE guidance documents link provides guidance on the implementation of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. To access the Grants Administration website, Start on TA's homepage, hover over the Finance and Grants tab, and select Grants Administration located under the Grants heading. The web page pictured here is the Grants Administration landing page. On the right hand side, there are three blue bars. Under the bar titled Grants, you can access information. Grant basics, which include descriptions of the different types of grants awarded by TEA, i.e. formula and discretionary grants. Discretionary grants include both competitive and non-competitive grants. Applying for a grant describes what an RFA is, application types, e-grants versus PDF, completing and submitting applications, the review and negotiation process, forms for prior approval, disclosure and justification, administering a grant provides information about compliance with regulations, payment request, expenditure reporting, time and effort reporting, amending, and best practices for administering a grant. Grant resources includes budgeted guidance, expenditure reporting, trainings. As I previously mentioned, and the important dates for 22-23 will be posted here. The second blue bar titled Related Content Pages provides quick access to important and frequently needed information that will be located on our various web pages. Finally, the blue bar outlines grant administration contact information. By selecting the division contacts link, it will take you to a document that you can use to reach the grants administration division. Here are the division contacts for grants administration. Grant negotiators are listed by region, our expenditure reporting team, and additional contacts for the Grants Administration team.
If your questions are not answered during the course of this session, you can always send those questions to your negotiator or to the Grants Administration email box so that we can answer your questions. Especially if the question is specific to your grant, we can look at your application to make sure you have everything correct and that you have documented what you need.